we meet on Jara land, home of the Jar Jar Wurrung people. For many millennia, they tended this land, they sang its songs, they danced its stories. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and we acknowledge that sovereignty of this land was never ceded. Welcome to worship with the Waruna congregation. This week we are coming to you from White Hills, an older suburb of Bendigo in the northeastern corner. It is the third Sunday of Pentecost and we continue to hear the story of Job and his struggles. We also celebrate the anniversary of the Uniting Church, inaugurated 43 years ago tomorrow. For our, join, uh, for our call to worship this morning, I invite you to share in the response, Come to us, O God. When we find ourselves alone in the wilderness, come to us, O God. In the stillness, come to us, O God. When we are afraid, Come to us, O God. In unknown places, come to us, O God. When we feel rejected by others, come to us, O God. In all times and in all places, come to us, O God. We'll sing the hymn, let us sing to the rock of salvation. Let us pray. We speak your praises, God of mystery, God of grace and wonder. We shout for the great things you have done. We whisper with awe when we speak of the depth of your love. Music arises from deep within our souls, and our lips, with our lips we sing our songs of celebration and joy. With our hearts, 
we dance to the rhythms that your spirit has implanted deep within our lives. Great and wonderful are your ways, O Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We give you our gratitude and praise, now and always. Amen. For our confession this week, I'm using a poem by Ted Loder. It's called, God, Are You There? God, are you there? I've been taught and told I ought to pray. But the doubt won't go away. Yet neither will my longing to be heard. My soul sighs too deep for words. Do you hear me? God, are you there? Are you where love is? I don't love well or often anything or anyone. But when I do, when I take the risk, there's a sudden awareness of all I've missed. And it's good. It's singing good. For a moment, life seems as it should. But I forget. So busy, so soon, that it was, or what, or whom. Help me, God, are you there? Rejoice and give praise to God with us in our struggles and our doubts, and know that your sins are forgiven. Last week was Refugee Week, and uh, we've thought a lot about refugees, and we've had lots of opportunity to think about what it is that they're going through, how it is that they suffer. These are some of the images that people have sent along for Refugee Week. Thank you to everyone who sent along those images to give us things to think about, things to reflect upon. And next week, our reading in Job takes us into the area of thinking about God and God's creation. Now, that is a rich source of imagery for us all. So I want you to think about the world that God has made, the big world of mountains and forests and big animals, the little world of insects and tiny little microscopic things too. Whatever you want to, uh, draw it, paint it, photograph it, share it with us and help us to think about the wonderful world that God has created. I've got some images for us. I've got some images for us to think about and I'll just share them with you now. The first one is by the artist Monet. The second one by the artist Rousseau. After those uh, basically landscapes, we've got a picture by Margaret Preston of some flowers. She's an Australian artist. And then we've got a landscape by Albert Namatjura, the famous indigenous indigenous artists from the 1950s. 
We've got one by Sid Nolan painting Antarctica. One by Arthur Boyd of uh, a landscape with water. And I've got some botanic art that takes us down to smaller things. Uh, some by uh, Heidi Willis and a picture by Judy Morris. And then there's a more a looser uh, painting by a woman, an Australian woman called Sandipa, followed by a couple of acrylics of my own and some gum leaves that I drew on my, my tablet. So there's some ideas. I'm sure you can come up with a lot more and um, send them in and we'll have a great day of uh, celebrating the world that God has made. We're going to sing the song, Goodness is Stronger Than Evil. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through him who loved us. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through him who loved us. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through him who loved us. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through him who loved us. Well, today is our third week uh, looking at Job. And we've got two more weeks after this week, so there's still plenty to come. Um, there's a lot to really appreciate in the book of Job. I've certainly enjoyed uh, getting stuck into it. And uh, what I in, want to invite you to do is to have a good look yourselves, because we're only, we're only scratching the surface of it. There's so much here, that's so much that's beautiful and rich. Uh, grab yourself a good modern translation. I particularly recommend the Good News Bible. It's fairly easy to follow. And not only that, but when you get towards the uh, end, they actually offer some uh, clar clarity in who's, who it is who's actually speaking. It's not always plain from the text without that. The book, in fact, is fairly repetitive, but it's repetitive in a poetic way. It's also quite cyclic. Each of Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad and Zophar, take it in turn to accuse Job of sinning and they offer their advice. They insist that Job is being punished justly for his sin. And each of his so-called friends speaks, and then Job responds to them, protesting his innocence. And he gets quite heated at times. Job also speaks directly to God, lamenting his suffering and complaining about God's unfair treatment of him. There are three cycles of speeches. And the third spike diverges from the pattern of the first two. And as I said, that's where the Good News Bible is particularly helpful, identifying the voices and making sense of it all. And the third cycle adds a new voice, Elihu, a bystander who has witnessed the debate and feels compelled to put his two bobs worth in. And it's a good two bobs worth running across six chapters of the book. Well, Job doesn't get to respond to Elihu as God takes over, speaking to Job from within a whirlwind. And that's where we go next week. 
This week we're hearing two passages from, from Job the person. The first begins with an observation about mortality and it concludes with an address to God. We'll hear the first reading now from Job chapter 14, verse 7 to 15. There is hope for a tree that has been cut down. It can come back to life and sprout. Even though its roots grow old and its stumps die in the ground, with water it will sprout like a young plant. But people die, and that is the end of them. They die, and where are they then? Like rivers that stop running and lakes that go dry, people die never to rise. They will never wake up while the sky endures. They will never stir from their sleep. I wish you would hide me in the world of the dead. Let me be hidden until your anger is over and set a time to remember me. If people die, can they come back to life? But I will wait for better times. Wait till this time of trouble is ended. Then you will call and I will answer and you will be pleased with me, your creature. Now, a lot of people, including some commentators, are very good at digging out positive expressions of faith in Job. So they read it in the light of their own Christian faith, rather than looking at what the text is actually saying. They look for intimations of resurrection or life beyond death. And I'm not sure that there are any in this book, and certainly not in this passage. Belief in life after death comes fairly late in Judaism, and it was never universally accepted. Even in the time of Jesus, we find the Sadducees disagreeing with the Pharisees, insisting that death is the end. In Job's time, we find reference to Sheol as the place of the dead. It seems to have been a place of oblivion rather than as a realm where the dead go on existing. And this is what Job is saying. But people die and that is the end of them. They die and where are they then? Now Job's suffering is so great that he expresses his desire that he should be hidden among the dead. Perhaps if he is out of sight, God might forget about him and forget to punish him. And when God's anger has abated, Job is hoping, then perhaps God might remember him and call him back to resume his life. The big idea behind so much of Job's demands is that he should stand before God and argue his case. He is confident that he has done nothing to warrant such punishment, such suffering. And that God would confirm this if he could just arrange a hearing. That's what he wants, his day of judgment. He's convinced that if he ever gets that day, God will be forced to declare him righteous and acknowledge that he has been treated unjustly. He would like that day of judgment now, but he accepts that he may have to wait until his life is over. But I will wait for better times. Wait till this time of trouble is ended. Then you will call and I will answer and you will be pleased with me, your creature. Job wants vindication. He wants to be able to walk from the celestial court 
waving his declaration of innocence in his hand and to say to all those who have been so ready to condemn him, see, I told you so. Which brings us to the next passage. This time, it is addressed to his friends. And we hear from Job chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. How I wish that someone would remember my words and write them in a book, or with a chisel carve my words in stone, or write them so that they would be would last forever. But I know there is someone in heaven who will come at last to my defence. Even after my skin is eaten by disease, while still in this body, I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes, and he will not be a stranger. And this is the word of the Lord. Job wants to stand before God to demand justice. And even if God has forgotten him, Job is confident that someone in the divine courts, presumably an angel or such, will have seen his plight come to his defence and plead on his behalf. And he is so confident of the outcome that he wants a permanent record to be made of his complaint in a book, or better yet, chiselled in stone, so that when the judgment is given, all will be able to see just how badly he has been treated. So, what is there in this story for us? We don't quite share the same worldview that Job and his friends shared. Our understandings are shaped by Jesus, informed by grace and forgiveness of a God who is characterised by compassion, who seeks justice ahead of sacrifice. Last week, we commended Job's friends for their empathy, for their willingness to sit silently with Job in his despair and his pain. While there's not much empathy now, his friends get stuck into him and he responds in kind. They keep insisting that his suffering is a result of his sin. He insists that God has treated him badly and that his friends have no idea. In addressing the accusation of his friends, elsewhere Job declares in chapter 13, Everything you say I have heard before, I understand it all. I know as much as you do. I'm not your inferior. But my dispute is with God, not with you. I want to argue my case with him. Now, getting in the way of Job's friends having empathy, Job's so-called friends can't see past their theological convictions to see Job, the man and his pain. Their understanding of the way of God and the way God works means that they can't possibly concede that Job might be in the right. Job is being punished by God, therefore he must have sinned. It's the same sort of attitude that Jesus came up against with the religious leaders in his day. It was they who decided who were worthy and who were unworthy, who was righteous and who had sinned, who was in and who was out. And they never entertained the notion that they could possibly be wrong. 
Not much empathy here or grace from Job's so-called friends. And not much openness to one's neighbour who is suffering or willingness to understand their situation or what it is that they are going through. Across the course of our history, there are assumptions and prejudices that have done much damage and inflicted much pain, most of which, at some stage, have found biblical and theological support. Assumptions of racial superiority that justify human rights violations and slavery even today. Assumptions of gender inferiority that lead to subjugation of and violence towards women. Assumptions about the God-given right of humankind to rule and to dominate that lead to the exploitation and despoilment of the planet. Assumptions about moral superiority. Assumptions about religion and science. Assumptions about God's purposes. Assumptions about the scriptures. The book of Job confronts us, as did Jesus. It challenges our prejudices and assumptions, especially those that form barriers between us and our neighbours. The theological presuppositions, the social prejudices, the historical assumptions that keep us from seeing our neighbours' realities, that hold us back from showing acceptance, welcome and care and prevent us from guarding the justice and dignity of our fellow creatures that allow us to pretend that there are limits to love. Let us pray. Lord, remove our convenient blindness. Help us to resist those assumptions that may prove to be false and that lead us to attitudes of superiority. Open our eyes to the truth of our neighbours. Open our lives to the possibilities of letting go. Open our hearts to love. Amen. Let's sing the, the wonderful hymn, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
let your light so shine among others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We worship God with our offerings. Let us pray. Merciful Father, receive and bless our offerings, including our gifts, and so consecrate our bodies, minds, and spirits by the operation of your Holy Spirit, that we may give ourselves to you, a living sacrifice, dedicated and fit for your acceptance, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come to our prayers of the people. In this prayer, I'm going to create some silences, except that silences are going to be brought about by my triangle. And so we just listen as the triangle is struck until it's faded away. Ever-present God, Revealed in so many ways, may our words and good intentions be balanced with silence. We place the silence here for all conflict, where platitudes of peace are not enough. Stir in our silence a commitment to peace-filled living. We place a silence here for all poverty and hunger, where words of blessing and good will do not satisfy. Move through our silence and give us a vision of a world where everyone has enough. We place a silence here for all injustice in a world where the sound bite slogans are a poor substitute for empathy and an inadequate response to people's pain. Rise up in our silence and make us prophets in word and deed. We place a silence here for all suffering, where sympathetic prayers do not relieve the pain. Draw near in our silence, and through your example, show us how to bring true comfort to others. May all our silence create a space broad enough for tears and for prayer, a space deep enough for commitment, for committed and defiant actions, a space large enough to hold the justice and the hope that you purpose for your creation. God, we pray for those people who suffer from injustice, First Nations people and others who also suffer because of racism, refugees and asylum seekers who cry out in pain and despair, victims of domestic violence, abuse and poverty who also cry out. Have mercy, Lord. We pray for all who are broken, desperate, aching, and weeping. God, we pray for our church and its mission as we celebrate our 43rd anniversary as a uniting church. Help us to remain open to the new things that you are doing and are planning to do. We pray today especially for our Assembly President, Deidre Palmer, for moderator Denise Leersch, and for those who lead our presbytery, Chairperson Judy Corson, 
and Presbytery Ministers Rose, Bob and Siatami. We pray for those who lead our congregation, for Michael and Elise, and for our church council, elders and other leaders. We pray too for Susan and her family and look forward to her return. God, help us to learn from these demanding times Guide and strengthen us that we might deal creatively with the challenge of being faithful servants within our current constraints. Hear our prayers, Almighty God. In the name of Jesus Christ, who prays with us and for us, to him be praise forever. And we join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We sing the hymn inspired by love and anger.
go into this timeless land knowing that God who holds all things will be with us in the desert times, that Christ who calls us friend will walk the track with us, and that the Spirit who dreams our story will mark our way with light and hope. Grace, love and joy are yours. Go in peace. One, two, three, and sit by the Lord and I. My hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which the kingdom comes. Sit by the Lord and I. My hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which the kingdom comes. The angels cannot change a world of hurt and